Join the PRS Journal Club. Read the monthly picks and classic pairings on prsjournal.com. Discuss with the authors on Twitter at PRS Journal and listen to the podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the November 2017 special master's edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast focusing on reconstructive surgery. My name's Chad Purnell, PRS resident ambassador from Northwestern, and as always, I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Suja Shafkat from Fox Chase Cancer Center and Jordan Fry from NYU. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. David Chang, chief of the section of plastic surgery at the University of Chicago. Thanks very much, Dr. Chang, for joining us for the special Masters of Plastic Surgery edition of the Journal Club podcast. Thank you. The article we'll be discussing next is Sural Nerve Splitting in Reverse Sural Artery Perforator Flap, Anatomical Study in 40 Cadaver Legs, from Drs. Kim, Hu, Chang, and Kim from the Seoul National University in Korea. Remember, all this month's articles can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. So, to give a quick introduction, The authors briefly note that the reverse sural flap is a useful flap in lower extremity reconstruction because it provides a pedicled option in the distal third of the leg that has thin tissue. However, whenever this is harvested subfascially, this flap does sacrifice the sural nerve, which results in anesthesia or paresthesia of the lateral foot. And the authors endeavored to develop a nerve-sparing flap dissection. So how they went about this was they did an anatomic study of 40 different cadaver legs, and they identified the lateral sural cutaneous nerve origin from the perineal nerve, and then the medial sural cutaneous nerve origin from the tibial nerve. They utilize a coordinate system to identify the convergence pattern of these nerves into the sural nerve, which is the convergence of these two nerves they're calling the S point. And they also identified the areas where these nerves pierce the deep fascia, and these were called the M and L points. And so then they planned their flap design. So in order to do this, they ligate the lateral serocutaneous nerve, then they elevated the flap subfascially, and they preserved a 5 centimeter adipofascial strip with the pedicle. Then they identify the medial serocutaneous nerve, and they perform an intrafascicular dissection of the sural nerve until the flap rotates to the defect. And so this technique effectively maintains the medial sural portion of the nerve so that they don't completely transect the nerve. They basically just do this intrafascicular dissection until the flap rotates as far as they need. What they found in the results were they identified three different patterns of the ML and S points. So the first pattern they saw was what they called a diminished pattern, and this was in about 17% of patients, or of legs, I should say, where the lateral serocutaneous nerve essentially peters out and never really gives any contribution. Then in 10% of legs, they saw a parallel pattern where the lateral and medial serocutaneous nerves never join, and so basically there's just two nerves that run straight down. And then finally, in about three-quarters of patients, they saw what they call the combined pattern. And this is when the lateral and medial sural cutaneous nerves meet to become the sural nerve. So what they noted anatomically is in these patients, the medial nerve pierces the fascia more distally, which is what allows them to dissect the flap in this way. In general, they found the M point to be about 1.2 centimeters from the midline of the leg. And the L point was about 4 centimeters from the midleg. The S point, whenever they saw these nerves converging, that was about two centimeters proximal to the mid-leg point. And so they said that they were able to harvest a split nerve and preserve the medial sural nerve in all the combined type nerves to increase the arc of rotation of the flap without dividing. So in the discussion, the authors note that the reverse sural flap is the best pedicled option for larger defects in the distal third of the leg. And they also noted that their technique, this modification, which preserves some sensation, will also take an additional about 7 to 15 minutes. However, it's not really clear to me if this technique took an extra 7 to 15 minutes in a cadaver or if this was in a live patient. They contrast this with complete preservation of the sural nerve, which may divide the sural nerve's arterial perforator supply, which is the secondary blood supply to this flap, and may take additional time. So they present this as a potential option to improve sensory outcomes while performing this flap and maintaining efficiency. I enjoyed this paper overall. My thoughts were that realistically, if you're doing a reverse sural flap at this point, it's usually a bailout option. So either your free flap has failed, 
or you're in a situation where you're you have no distal targets to plug your free flap into and so i think as free flaps become faster they have less morbidity this flap is really sort of a secondary option however Certainly improvement is warranted. This flap does sacrifice a non-essential nerve. And if there is a way to preserve some sensation without taking too much time, and most importantly, without decreasing the vascularity, why not do it? I still do have some concerns that this sacrifices some blood supply. In order to do this technique, you have to skeletonize the nerve and you have to open up the epineurium. So there's certainly going to be more manipulation of the secondary blood supply to this flap as opposed to just dividing the nerve and leaving the flap with a very broad subcutaneous pedicle. I think whenever you're doing this flap, you're already worried about potential venous congestion or inflow problems. And I think sensation is really a secondary concern. So while I think this is a good technique and certainly would be an improvement on the sensation after harvesting this flap, I think people are going to be reticent about doing any modification that could compromise the blood supply to this flap. But I think most importantly, this paper highlights that we should always be looking to improve techniques, even techniques that have been around for a long time. So Dr. Chang, what I wanted to know uh, from you is, how does this flap, the reverse sural flap, fit into your practice in an age where microsurgery, free flaps, and perforator flaps are becoming more and more common? Yeah, uh, first of all, I think this was well done cadaver study. But I was hoping that they would have some clinical cases to kind of support what they found in the cadavers because, as you know, what we find in cadavers often does not translate very well clinically. I do like the, how they uh, split the sural nerve. And in fact, when I used to do a lot of sural nerve grafts for cavernous nerve reconstruction following uh, radical prostatectomy, I used to split sural nerves and just harvest one branch, so maintain the other branch to minimize the neuroside morbidity. Having said that, in terms of how that's fit into my practice, well, I'm a microsurgeon. I feel comfortable doing microsurgery. So for me, actually, I have never done reversal sural flap. I have never even considered it. The way I see it, and this is the reason, it's not that I don't think it works because I know plenty of people do this on a regular basis and good, good, good results. But the few cases that I've seen my colleagues do, the results have not been all that stellar. They tend to have a lot of venous congestions and have a, a problems. And when you have a defect, let's say, on your heel or in the ankle, and then you do a reverse roll flap, and then you, it dies, now your defect is like two or three times bigger than before. So if you go into a free flap then, it's much more difficult reconstruction than before. So I am of a school that you should have used your best and most reliable option first not as a backup. Some people say, well, I'll do a free flap, it fails. I think you should do your best option first. And for me, in most cases, it's a free flap. So do a, uh, if it's a heel, you can do a medial plantar flap as a rotation flap, or do a small radial forearm free flap, or muscle flap and skin graft, whatever fits that patient at that point. And so for me, it is not something that I consider in my practice. But for those who are in a situation where microsurgery is difficult to do because you're in a remote area or you're not a microsurgeon, then certainly I think sural, reverse sural flap is an option. What I might do if I ever have to do it is I may delay it. I may delay it so that it improves the chances of the flap surviving. I think that's what I may do. Jordan and uh, Shuja and I were talking about this article a little bit. And between the three of us, I think we've each done one of these previously. And so I think at least in places where microsurgery is common, this just isn't really being done that often. Jordan, what did you think of this paper? I agree with everything said, and I think, you know, it, it's an interesting article, and it's, it's a very, you know, detailed kind of cadaveric study. But I also, you know, was kind of looking for the, the clinical portion of it, I guess. And I think Dr. Chang's point, obviously, is a really good one that, you know, if you, if you have a critical defect and you should use your best option first, and then if that doesn't work, you, you have, you know, something like this as a bailout in mind, but you want to give the best reconstruction possible from the get-go. A bit of an offshoot but related question, Dr. Cheng. On the topic of microsurgery and flap choice, one, one of the flaps we've been using a lot more kind of under the guidance of Dr. Levine is the medial sural artery perforator flap, and we've started using that a lot for head and neck and even some upper extremity and have kind of favored it as like a 
thin pliable kind of flap with a better donor site than the radial forearm flap necessarily. But I want to know if you have any experience with this or opinions or thoughts on that free flap. Yes, I have used it uh, several times and I like it. It's pretty quick. But you know, it, it's not as thin as I would like it to be, particularly in our group of patients. In fact, yesterday I had a case where I wanted to do radio forearm flap, but I was not convinced that the patient's arch in the hand were intact, so I didn't want to risk it. So I was thinking about looking at another thin flap because was, this was intraoral reconstruction. And I looked at the patient's calves to, to, to the medial sural peripheral flap, and her calf was very thick. You know, it was as thick as ALT. So in many of our patients in the Western culture, that flap can be rather thick as well. So, but it is a good flap, and I, I have done it actually uh, several times. I think it's a good flap. It's not another flap that we can think about using. So, yeah. I think it's interesting, and I think it definitely has a place within everything, but it's been fun kind of learning that. It's a popular flap, particularly in Asia. They do a lot of it. Shuja, what did you think of this paper? I thought this was a pretty interesting anatomical study. I think that the reverse sural flap is something that tends to get kind of overlooked, especially now that free flaps have such a great success rate. My biggest problem with this flap is, you know, a lot of times people want to use it for patients who might not be able to tolerate a long procedure due to comorbidities, but those are some of the patients who may have the same comorbidities that would cause an increased rate of flap failure. You know, like Dr. Chang mentioned, I think that some of the issues with partial flap necrosis can be overcome with delay procedures. Some people have talked about leaving a wider and a cutaneous pedicle rather than the traditional adipofascial pedicle, but then that requires interpolating the flap in a second procedure. I also wonder how this technique would hold up in a clinical model. You know, like we mentioned, the pedicle to the flap is already a little bit tenuous. Dissecting close to the pedicle in order to preserve a nerve seems to increase the risk with limited benefit. In fact, in one of the papers that they referenced on the sural nerve donor site morbidity for nerve grafts, they actually showed that a majority of patients reported significant decrease in things like pain, cold intolerance, and numbness over time, and actually had pretty high satisfaction rates with the donor site, with 21% of patients reporting complete resolution of any donor site morbidity symptoms. Symptoms. But there were some other smaller studies that they did reference that showed this kind of technique in a clinical model with decent success. So those are my thoughts on the paper. Dr. Chang, you mentioned a little bit about when you used to do sural nerve grafts, more frequently splitting the nerve to reduce donor site morbidity. When you used to do these more commonly harvesting sural nerve, did you notice these common problems with donor site morbidity? What was your experience with that that led you to do more nerve splitting to try to preserve that sensation on the lateral foot? Yeah, actually, I did uh, study that, and uh, we measured the area of the numbness area and the lateral portion of the uh, foot. And we did find that when we didn't have to harvest the entire nerve, that the area of the, de the deficit was much smaller. And so I think that was one benefit. And then I would, I would just do with two small incisions rather than a big, making a big vertical incision. So the measurements that they mentioned in this paper are pretty accurate. I mean, you can measure it and me measure out where they will join, and you can then just uh, make a small incisions at those two points and then just take out one branch rather than take the entire one out. And most of the time, not all the time, because sometimes they are not two branches. You know, they're just one branch. We have some variations. So I think uh, it was a good anatomic study. I hope they are actually using this information and applying it clinically, and maybe there will be a follow-up paper on that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll kick it back to Chad for the wrap-up. Thanks, Shuja. I think that's been a really great discussion of this paper. I think we all have a pretty good sense now of what sort of the advantages and disadvantages of doing this flap might be, but this is a potentially useful modification. We'll all wait for the clinical study. I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Remember to tune in to the other two articles we'll be discussing on this month's podcast, as well as all of our previous and future podcasts broadcasted every month. Also, don't forget to participate in our monthly hashtag PRS Journal Club on Twitter, where we'll be able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. And once again, thank you very much, Dr. Chang, for joining us. Thank you.